Chapter the Thirty Fourth of the Manchester Man by Mrs. G. Linnaeus Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Birds of a Feather. The Palace Inn on the north side of Market Street Lane was the last relic of that cramped thoroughfare to disappear at the bidding of improvement. Possibly because its many eyes and bald, dark red brick face looked out on a space so much beyond the twenty-one yards assigned by Act of Parliament to the regenerated street, that the Improvement Committee had no powers to meddle with it. For surely its historic associations were not sufficient to protect it. Prince Charles Edward had been hospitably lodged and entertained beneath its roof by its owner, Mr. Dickinson, long ere it had become an inn. He had harangued his devoted followers from the stone plateau of its double flight of steps, with his hand perchance on its smooth rail of unornamented iron, but in isolated dignity, rather than palatial pretensions, lay its chief safeguard. Be that as it may, fourteen or fifteen years elapsed between the first act of demolition for widening, at the shop of a Mr. Maund, and that last feat of narrowing, which blocked up and darkened history, as represented by the palace, with common stone warehouses for everyday merchandise. Alas! Cleo and all her sister muses must succumb when Mammon is on the march. But Mammon had only got his first foot in the street on that Thursday morning in July, which blushed at the doings of the coronation night, and the palace inn yet held its head high as beseemed its historic state. The open space in front was enlivened by the newly painted London stagecoach, the Lord Nelson, the fresh scarlet coats of coachmen and guards, the assembling of passengers and luggage, the shouting and swearing of half-awake ostlers and porters, the grumbling of the first comers, shivering in the raw air at the unpunctuality of the stage, the excuses of the booking clerk, the self-gratulations of the last arrival, that he was in time, the dragging of trunks and portmanteaus on to the top, the thrusting of bags and boxes into the boot, the harnessing of snorting steeds, the horsing of the vehicle, the scrambling of the outsiders to the top by the ladder and wheel, the self-satisfied settlement of the insides in the places they had booked for, the crushing and thrusting of friends with last messages and parting words, the crack of the whip, the sound of the bugle, the prancing of horses, the rattle of wheels, and the dashing off up Market Street Lane of the gallant four in hand, amid the hurrahs of excited spectators. Every morning witnessed a somewhat similar scene of bustle and excitement at five o'clock when the London coach started, but every morning did not see Jabez mounted on the box seat with the coachman. Nor did every morning see the coach an hour behind time, or the driver's face quite so red, or the spectators so heavy-eyed, or so much handing up of horns and glasses to the passengers, to be returned empty, or leave Mr. Ashton standing there when the Lord Nelson had bowled away. That coronation day had much to answer for. When Tom Hume should have risen at four o'clock to return home, his bruised limbs were so stiff and sore, that the soldier who had borne the fatigue of many a campaign, who had bivouacked on the battlefield after a forced march, and being ready with the sun for the day's duties, had to confess himself fettled by Lancashire clogs, and unable to stir. There was no alternative but to acquaint Mr. Ashton. The mill could not be left without a manager. After the night's unwanted dissipation, Mr. Ashton slept heavily, and was with difficulty aroused. When once he comprehended the state of affairs, he was on the alert. "'It's a bad business,' said he to his wife, as he dressed in haste. "'There is nothing so bad, but it might be worse,' was her consolatory reply. "'Never bewail a loss till you have done your best to repair it. Can you not send Mr. Clegg to Whaley Bridge for a few days?' "'My dear, your counsel is invaluable, but I fear there is not time to catch the coach.' It is twenty minutes past four now. It is sure to be late this morning, and Jabez will catch it if it is to be caught, was her quick rejoinder. Bess had already awakened Jabez, and he, fully dressed, 
met Mr. Ashton at his bedroom door with, "'Can I be of any service, sir?' a prompt commentary on Mrs. Ashton's declaration. A few necessaries hastily crammed into a carpet-bag, a bowl of milk and a crust of bread as hastily swallowed, and Jabez, accompanied by Mr. Ashton, was on his way to the palace coach-office, confident they were in time, not having heard the guard's bugle, or met the coach. There was, however, barely time to claim for Mr. Clegg the place already booked for Mr. Hume. Mrs. Hume's seat was forfeited, and for him to take his seat before they were off in a canter, and Mr. Ashton's business mind was relieved. As the manufacturer, satisfied that the mill-hands at Whaley Bridge would not be left altogether to their own devices, stood within a short distance of the high steps looking after the vanishing coach, a party of roisterers came swaggering out of the inn, hallooing with all their tipsy might. One in advance of the rest, observing an elderly gentleman below, pointed him out to his companions as fair game, and leaning over the rail to steady himself, cried out, "'Hallo, old fogey! Are you a Tory or a Radical? Damn me! Take your hat off before gentlemen!' And suiting the action to the word, extended a riding-whip he carried, and jerked Mr. Ashton's hat off into the dust, whereupon his worthy comrades set up a loud guffaw in admiration of the feat." Naturally, Mr. Ashton, his brief reverie disturbed, stooped to pick up the fallen beaver, and making due allowance for the unwanted occasion, turned to remonstrate good-humouredly with an excited stranger who had evidently drunk the king's health too frequently. It was not with more surprise than annoyance that he recognised four of the hilarious party in the doorway and on the steps of the inn, which had apparently been open the night through. Not one of the four was in a condition to recognise him, although two of them, John Wormsley and Lawrence Aspinall, had supped overnight at his own table, although the third, Kit Townley, had good reason for remembrance, and Ned Barrett was anything but a stranger. Loud laughter hailed the fall of the hat. A second attempt to uncover the obstinate old fogey was made, but dexterously avoided by Mr. Ashton, in his absolute astonishment, stepping backward beyond range. "'Young gentleman, do you know whom you are insulting?' There was another laughing chorus. Aspinall almost toppled over the rail as he leaned forward, impotently striking out with his whip. "'I protest, ye old rads dimly like the lovely Augustus snuffy old dad,' drawled out he, in a sort of tipsy wisdom. "'Just so!' appended Wormsley, mimicking the old gentleman's peculiarity. Mr. Ashton, though a reasonably temperate man himself, was not so greatly shocked at these young carousers as we might be. Long usage blunts sensibilities. It was a glorious distinction to be a three-bottle man. The inability to drink a solitary bottle of wine at a sitting was a sort of disqualification for good fellowship and it was considered a fine thing for a boy of seven to toss off a glass like a man. So the genial old gentleman was inclined to allow some latitude for the special occasion, but they had touched him on a tender point. The light mention of his darling daughter's name roused his blood. "'John Wormsley!' he cried angrily, looking up. "'What brings you, a married man, with these young rakes at this hour of the morning?' "'Pray!' "'What brought you here, old fogey?' <laughs> hiccuped Aspinall, answering for the other. One of the ostlers, Bob, the ex-groom, squeezed between the rollicking fellows to whisper in the ear of Lawrence. He was impatiently thrust back with an elbow. "'Psh! Don't believe it. Oh, snuff and tup in his fast sleep in bed. Sure she gone. I know b better. I say, you!' But old Snuff and Tuppany had turned on his heel, too wise to enter into contention with a set of inebriated boobies, though not proof against the disrespectful epithets of Lawrence, or the derisive laughter of his boon companions. His irritation half emptied his snuff-box before he got home, so often he tapped smartly on its golden lid, and so often his finger and thumb travelled between it and his nose with a touch of ruminant displeasure. Neither he nor Mrs. Ashton was disposed to overlook the fact 
that Kit Townley and Ned Barrett, scapegraces by repute, were of the party, nor that Augusta's name had been familiarly used in their midst. "'Birds of a feather flock together,' said the lady. "'And if Mr. Aspinall's son associates with that reckless and dishonest Kit Townley, he is a very unfit friend for John Wormsley, and still worse for our dear Augusta.' "'Just so, for a dashing blade with a handsome face, who sports a uniform, talks poetry, and sings sentimental songs, is just the fellow to take a silly girl's fancy before she's old enough to think. I know, I regret I ever brought him here, said Mr. Ashton seriously, as Augusta came in the room to breakfast, entering at the door behind her mother's back. Well, William, observed Mrs. Ashton loftily, her hand on the china coffee-pot, you can imagine my annoyance when John and Mr. Lawrence walked arm in arm last night after the liberty he had taken in the morning, kissing his hand to our daughter from the public procession in the face of all our friends, as if Augusta had been a flaunting barmaid. I was most indignant. Augusta said, Good morning, and took her seat with a heightened colour. Such a construction of the gallant officer's salute had not occurred to her and native delicacy took alarm. Mrs. Ashton continued to pour out her thoughts along with the coffee. It was fit Augusta should know her sentiments on this head. "'It would have been a breach of hospitality to resent it before our friends, and not good policy either, but I shall put a stop to his visits henceforth.' "'Oh, mamma! exclaimed Augusta, dropping her hands at this climax. "'You cannot mean that!' "'Yes, my dear, I do.' If Mr. Aspinall has depraved associates, he must be depraved himself, and I am sure my daughter, she drew herself up proudly, would not choose her friends from those of Christopher Townley. Augusta's colour suffered no decrease. She paused as she was taking her dry toast from the silver rack, and half hesitatingly remonstrated, Of course I should not wish to associate with Mr. Townley's friends, but papa may be mistaken. I do not think Mr. Aspinall would mix with them. People meet and mingle at coach offices who are strangers. Just so, my dear, but, interposed her father. Why, mamma, the persistent young lady went on, no more perfect gentleman enters our doors than Mr. Lawrence Aspinall. His manners are most refined. Then he talks enchantingly and sings divinely, and, this she thought conclusive, is he not intimate with Charlotte and John? Just so, quickly answered Mr. Ashton, glancing across the table at his attentive wife, and all the worse for Charlotte and John. I shall have a word with them on the subject. I called in Marsden Square on my way home, and found Charlotte with red eyes. John had not been home all night, and Mr. Ashton battered the top of an egg, whilst delivering what he regarded as a crushing argument. Breakfast and the discussion were unusually prolonged. The only impression left on the young lady's romantic, impressible, and inexperienced mind being that her parents were unaccountably harsh to her and unjust to Mr. Lawrence, in her eyes the beau ideal of a man. Such a figure and such a face could only enshrine divinity, and if he was a little wild, so were all heroes at his age. Let not the inexperienced girl be overmuch condemned for this. The opinion generally prevailed in her day. She had heard the sentiment expressed in farces on the stage, in society, at home, and elsewhere. Even her own father's hospitality trended in the same direction. Mrs. Ashton was a woman of her word. The door in Mosley Street was closed against Mr. Lawrence Aspinall and James was incorruptible. But the teaching of Miss Bohanna's library being that love was far-seeing, and parents were blind, it followed that Miss Augusta, who would have resented any supposition of willful disobedience or intentional disrespect towards the good father and mother she loved so dearly, met the fascinating gentleman, always by chance, either at her cousin's in Marsden Square or in her walks abroad, and scented billet doux came and went between the leaves of four-volumed romances, which Cicely carried to and from the library. One of these fell into Mrs. Ashton's hands, when, finding her advice contemned, 
she took measures to check this premature and clandestine love-making, as she thought, effectually. End of chapter the 34th